Thank you. Um, perhaps one writer to this. I think we can all agree that from a purely monetary, point, uh, monetary policy point of view, uh, both green policies as well as in the Ukraine tend to result in higher, ri rises, uh, in, in higher prices rather than lower ones. So could we agree that from a monetary policy, both those things are almost unaffordable, especially in a time of high inflation? I think the, uh, they touch on different um, areas. And uh, the determination uh, in, in terms of climate change and the risk that it consists of uh, for, from a, a risk assessment basis, as well as from a monetary policy determination, uh, remains, unfortunately, and is sufficiently critically important and material that we have to take it into account. On the other matter, I would leave it to the foreign affairs and the uh, political leaders to make their determination, but it seems to me that it's a pretty obvious choice that is only one direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Johan van Overfeld for ECR. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, President Lagarde, for being here. Um, I'd like to uh, dig a little bit deeper in what you said on price stability and financial stability. Uh, you, the ECB, you, the ECB, has been increasing interest rates to stop inflation. Given the evolution of core inflation, you will have to continue with that kind of policy. Now, that policy has a direct impact on financial stability because it reduces economic activity, which is an handicap for the repayment capacity of debtors, and it has an important impact on the value of bond portfolios and the related derivatives. So your anti-inflation policy, which I support very much, uh, as a direct impact on financial stability. So my question is, how do you, set, how do you ass assess the risk of having to stop um, prematurely with the monetary tightening policy, given its impact on financial stability? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. von Overveld, for the question. Uh, it will give me a chance to repeat again that there is no trade-off between price stability and financial stability, but it will also give me a chance to uh, mention that clearly financial um, stability tensions might have an impact on uh, demand and might actually do part of the work that would otherwise be done by monetary policy and interest rate hikes. That impact is uncertain at this point in time, but it will have to be taken into account when we produce our next projections and also when we do our next assessment and decide our next monetary policy move. So while very distinct and addressed with different tools, obviously one has an impact on the other and it will be visible in our projections. How do you assess the second round effect of uh, inflation uh, in the euro area? I'm especially referring to the labor cost increases that we saw in the last quarter of uh, last year, which were quite substantial, and compare that to the second round effect in the United States. Well, on the, on the labor market development, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, we have observed some we have observed two phenomena. One, a very robust labor market uh, with the lowest unemployment rate ever since we record unemployment rates with very high employment participation. Um, and however you measure, whether you use the wage tracker that we have um, um, used, drawing on information from seven countries in the euro area, or whether you use the analysis of new entries into corporates, which is a separate indicator of how tense the labor market is, uh, the numbers are climbing and the levels are much higher. We now have on the, uh, the wage tracker, we have an increase of 4.8%. And on the, uh, I think we call it the index uh, rate, we have uh, um, an increase of 5.2%. 
So there is a catch-up uh, with the uh, inflation that has been uh, suffered by uh, employees, and it's completely understandable that this catch-up is, is now taking place. There's always a lag effect uh, in the labour market, but we're now seeing it uh, very clearly. Is that second round? Um, it needs to be assessed on a longer period of time. We are not seeing actually uh, spinning of in spin, you know, the spinning out of inflation and uh, second round effects that that would be of high concern. Obviously, we are very attentive, and any such uh, wage increases in a robust markets are are quite um, predictable. And, and will probably be observed. But we're looking at that very, very carefully and we're trying to dissect uh, numbers on a per country basis, on a per sector basis, and depending at the, uh, on the entry level, uh, as well as the collective bargaining agreement that are negotiated. So I think we will, we will hear and we will understand a bit better what is going on in the labor market in the spring, because there are quite a lot of collective bargaining agreement that come for renegotiation now, and some that are being reopened for the past in order to adjust uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Um, now we start the second round. So one minute for the question and three for the answer with no follow-up. And we start uh, again with the EPP and I give the floor to Isabel Benjumea. Thank you, Chair. I will continue in Spanish. Muchísimas gracias. Señora Lagar, por estar aquí hoy, por contestar a todas, nuestras, a todas nuestras preguntas, muchas de las que tenía ya las ha contestado, por lo tanto seré breve. Hacía usted mención al eh, el, el elevadísimo dato de inflación que tenemos ahora mismo en la Unión Europea y en concreto lo preocupante que es el dato de la inflación eh, que contabiliza todo aquello que no es ni energía ni comida. Hacía usted una mención que dice que prevén que para el 2023 va a ser del 4,6% y a, a respuestas de algunos de mis colegas ha dicho que van a hacer todo lo que sea necesario para garantizar que vuelve al 2%. A mí me gustaría insistir en qué significa todo lo que sea necesario para que entendamos bien dónde estamos para poder llegar a ese 2%. Y luego, también en seguimiento a alguna de las preguntas que se ha hecho en relación al gasto público. Yo lo quería centrar mi pregunta en relación a la contratación pública. Me preocupa enormemente cómo ha crecido en Europa que el principal empleador en muchos Estados miembros se está convirtiendo el sector público, tanto las administraciones locales, regionales como nacionales, y el impacto que tiene ahora mismo esa situación sobre todo en países en los que tienen alta tasa, alta tasa de, de desempleo. Y, en último, si podía hacer alguna reflexión en relación a los altos costes de contratación y cómo están pudiendo influir en eh, la situación de la inflación actual. Muchas gracias. I think you summarized quite well uh, the concern that we have, uh, which is, um, I think, best, best epitomized by the three components that I have mentioned. One is the outlook for inflation, two is the underlying inflation components, three is the proper transmission. And the underlying inflation components, uh, as you said, we, we see them at 4.6% uh, this year, declining 24, but only arriving at 2.2% in 25, which is in the vicinity of our target, but it's not at target. And uh, obviously we have to take that into account and determine whether or not those you know, underlying components of inflation are going to be uh, on a declining trend or on the contrary are going to, uh, to, to um, be embedded and, and persist, uh, which will obviously determine our uh, monetary policy going forward, because we want those underlying in, uh, inflation components to, uh, to be on the declining path. Now, all economic actors play uh, their respective roles, and uh, you know, whether it's, it's public uh, procurement, whether it is uh, private consumption, uh, all of that matters. It is also a fact that in order to uh, return inflation to 2%, we are going to have to use interest rates and we are going to uh, 
this is going to lead to a dampening of, of demand, which is a precondition for inflation to return to 2%. We need to conduct that, uh, that process in, in, in a proportionate, effective and efficient way, which are two, three preconditions uh, for the validity of our decisions. And we do that uh, each and every time. But this is the path on which we are and, uh, and we will continue. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Pedro Silva Pereira for SND. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> President Lagarde, um, the controversial decision of the European Central Bank to increase again the interest rates by 50 basis points um, is explained uh, by you here today on the basis of projections uh, that were made before the recent uh, uh, emergence of uh, financial tensions. Would you agree that those tensions tend to uh, uh, bring uh, further decline in inflation than the opposite? This is important because we have to know if the decisions of the European Central Bank are not based on wrong assumptions about inflation. When we had here our last monetary dialogue in November, I asked you, did the um, uh, inflation reach the peak? At the time you said, uh, I don't think so, but now you are saying that the peak was in October last year and uh, you've seen uh, a decrease in, um, in the energy prices that led to uh, a new uh, projection on inflation. So the second question is, are we seeing uh, decisions being taken on the basis of wrong assumptions about inflation? And as you can imagine, uh, Mr. Silva Pereira, my answer to you will be no. <laughs> uh, we have made our decision on the basis of uh, staff projections, uh, which, as I said, had been uh, subject to a cut-off date which was prior to the financial tensions. But in any event, and given the distance that we have to cover and the inflation uh, that we are facing, this 50 basis point was a robust decision that needed to be taken. And we have taken that decision. What was, on the other hand, uh, reasonable was not to necessarily indicate, as of now, what subsequent decisions would be and to have an open mind. If it had only been based on the baseline, without the tensions, without the uncertainty, the aggravated uncertainty, um, we would have indicated that subsequent hikes would be needed. But on the, on the, in the face of the uncertainty that we, we had, it would not, and it was not, uh, the, the right um, policy indication to give, which is why we have determined that we would be data dependent and that we would uh, decide on the basis of the three elements that I have indicated already a couple of times. Now, we don't know how the uh, financial tensions are going to develop. We are very confident that our banking sector is uh, solid, is well capitalized, has strong liquidity ratios, and that the rules that apply in Europe under the directive frameworks that we have concerning resolution, notably, uh, are not the rules that have been applied by other institutions, notably by the Swiss authorities. Switzerland does not set standards in Europe. And that has been made very clear by the joint uh, statement that was released earlier on by the European Banking Association authorities, by the um, ECB supervision uh, arm, and by the, what was the third one? It was the SRB, of course. So SRB, ECB supervision, and EBA have been very specific on, on that and on the pecking order uh, that applies uh, in, in, in Europe. So, those financial tensions will have an impact. Which one, for how long, how deep, obviously remains to be seen. And if it does have an impact, it will probably lead to some tightening of the financing conditions that we are observing. We are already seeing some tightening of financing conditions. So we already see that our monetary policy actually has an impact. 
in the financing sector. We see it in the rates, we see it in the terms and conditions, we see, in the, we see it in the volume of lending. That might be accentuated because of the financial tensions, irrespective of you know, the strength and solidity of our banking sector. And we will have to take that into account as part of the data that we will receive when we make our next monetary policy decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll give the floor to um, Eva Popteva for Renew. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Madame Lagarde, for being with us today um, and for your very eloquent and very interesting replies. Um, I would like to come back to, the, um, to this relationship between the, as you already kind of hinted, the hikes of the interest rates might not be as steady as we've seen in the last months, um, at least no forward guidance, you said. So the other pillar basically would indeed be the quantitative tightening. Uh, and of course, we all know that more or less 80% on the balance sheet of the, um, of, the, of, of the European Central Bank are state bonds. So of course, many uh, do fear that if we have this quantitative tightening, then basically then this would lead to a certain spread uh, between the state bonds. On the other side, on the balance sheet, you also have some 20% of private assets within the asset purchase program. So uh, uh, I'm wondering uh, why you don't get rid basically on your balance sheet of, of these private assets first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Potia, for your sort of double questions. Um, and, and it helps me to clarify one point. Uh, I did not say that hikes will not be as steady in the future. I, I said that we were not giving forward guidance and that we would be data dependent going forward and that we would make our decisions on the basis of the inflation outlook informed by economic and financial data on the underlying inflation and on the strength of our monetary policy transmission. So what the outcome will be will be data dependent, okay? Um, that's, that's very clear. On, on your second, uh, the second part of your question concerning the uh, normalization of our, of our balance sheet, we have said um, when we started considering the reduction of our balance sheet that we would be transparent and predictable. And this is what we did by uh, clearly flagging that it would be 15 billion on average per month from March to the end of June and that we would apply that on a, on a smoothing basis in order not to privilege one category versus another, one country versus another. This is what we're doing, and we will continue to do so uh, until um, June, or rather the Monetary Policy uh, Governing Council meeting that will precede June, uh, at which point we will indicate uh, what we do going forward, whether we stay with the 15 billion, whether we go beyond or whichever decision we make at that point in time. But I think that the, you know, we, we are very clear on what exactly we're doing and it's, uh, it's the appropriate uh, way forward. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an accompanying element of our monetary policy. The key one is the use of interest rates and that's the most efficient one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Margarida Marques for S&D. Muito obrigada, Presidente. Muito obrigada, Presidente Lagarde, também por estar aqui a partilhar connosco esta uh, a situação uh, atual. Uh, e gostaria de lhe colocar três questões. A primeira, nós sabemos que a União Económica e Monetária, a União Bancária, a União de Mercado de Capitais continuam por completar. E a minha primeira questão é se considera que a existência de um efetivo seguro europeu de depósitos na atual União Bancária teria sido, seria, hoje, um fator-chave para reduzir a pressão sobre o sistema bancário europeu perante a atual crise. A minha segunda pergunta tem a ver com o TPI. Considera que os instrumentos atuais que o BCE tem no seu toolkit, como o TPI, são suficientes para enfrentar o nervosismo dos mercados. E, por outro lado, a ativar o TPI, de acordo com as regras de governação económica, se o BCE o irá fazer, tendo em conta as novas regras de governação económica nesta fase de transição 
que a Comissão Europeia apresentou. Finalmente, gostaria de perceber melhor das suas sucessivas respostas se uh, tem alguma preocupação no que diz respeito ao uso do Next Generation EU, a colocar no mercado o financiamento proveniente do fundo Next Generation EU. Thank you very much for the three three questions, and I'll try to address them um, in in turn. I couldn't agree more with you that banking union and capital marking union need to be completed. And I'm just curious as to what prevents us from moving forward. And I would really like to be able to count on you as a key member in those discussions to move forward on banking union. I think that the Commission is going to uh, soon propose Uh, this um, crisis management, uh, the CMID, uh, and, and I hope that we can move forward with that. It would be at least an indication that this banking union is not dead on arrival and that it's a project that has already two legs that are completed uh, and it needs the third one to be, to be completed as well. The CMID would be a good, good signal uh, to give. On the Capital Market Union, uh, I was a co-signatory together with the other presidents of an op-ed that was, uh, thank you very much, published in some countries, in which we all very strongly uh, advocate that the Capital Market Union be revived and completed as soon as possible. I regard that as a critical component for innovation, for competitiveness, for the depth of a financial market that should not be single-sourced, as unfortunately is too much the case uh, in the euro area. So on both accounts, I hope that things will move and, and in reasonably uh, short order. I have to say that the president of the Eurogroup has not spared his efforts uh, in the last couple of years in order to move the banking union, union project forward but as you know, has also encountered some political difficulties in several member states which uh, do not see that as, as an opportunity going forward. On your second uh, question, do we have the instruments? The answer to that is yes. <laughs> we do have the tools. Uh, we have them in, in the box. Some of them have been used and then have been returned to the toolbox. They're ready to be reactivated again anytime. And... Uh, You know, staff at the ECB has demonstrated whether it was with Teltro, with Peltro, with TPI, with any of the instruments that uh, we came up with during COVID and after COVID, uh, that they can adjust, they can calibrate, they can come up with the appropriate additional tool if we need one. I think that we are fully equipped. I'm not sure that I understood the link with the transition uh, that, uh, that you referred to, but if it's the transition to green and digital economy, I think the financing uh, operations that are available are certainly in, in, you know, in capacity to respond to the needs. On your third question, we have not seen uh, you know, additional and increased difficulties Uh, when, uh, when there was bond issuance in the most recent days, but obviously it's something that we need to pay attention to and to be, uh, we, we, we need to do the best job we can to the extent that we help the Commission in that respect in order to finance next-gen EU. The critical thing in my view about next-gen EU is the effective use of those funds uh, in, in complete accountability to the other member states and in complete accountability to members of the European Union so that this joint funding is properly um, used and, and will improve the competitiveness and will deliver on the transition that is so much needed for all of us. Thank you. Okay, now I give the floor to Claude Gruffa uh, for the Greens. Et merci. Bonjour, uh, Madame Tagarde. <coughs> Et merci d'être à nouveau parmi nous en ce moment de turbulences plutôt fortes sur les marchés. Face à la flambée de l'inflation, la BCE, comme les autres banques centrales, a fortement augmenté ses taux d'intérêt directeurs. Jeudi dernier encore, vous avez décidé une augmentation de 50 points de base supplémentaires. 
Or, si l'on trouve un point commun entre la faillite de la Silicon Valley Bank et la difficulté du crédit suisse, c'est certainement leur vulnérabilité au risque de taux. Bien que la remontée des taux d'intérêt semble de prime abord favorable à la profitabilité pardon, du secteur bancaire, elle comporte aussi des risques. Est-ce que dans ce contexte, la BCE envisage de nouvelles opérations de refinancement de plus, si de nouveaux programmes de ce type étaient introduits, ne devraient-ils pas inclure les décotes des garanties collatérales basées sur des actifs non verts Cela contribuerait également à garantir que les banques n'augmentent pas leur exposition aux actifs irrécupérables, les standard assets, et aux secteurs dont la viabilité diminuera dans le futur. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Je, je suis tentée de vous répondre en français, mais je vais peut-être vous répondre en... Allez, je vous réponds, je vous réponds en français. Euh... Je, 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 je ne partage pas tout à fait votre analyse selon laquelle euh, les, les, troubles expéri... enfin, les troubles subis par Signature Bank dans l'État de New York et Silicon Valley Bank dans l'État de Californie avec sa filiale en Angleterre et d'autres succursales ailleurs, soient liées l'une et l'autre aux mêmes causes. Je pense qu'on est vraiment en présence de phénomènes euh, profondément différents euh, et que bon, la Silicon Valley Bank a, est une espèce de, de, de cas pratique parfait euh, de ce qu'on appelle un bank run, euh, alors que la situation de Crédit Suisse est, 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 est un, un long dév développement euh, qui a donné lieu à, des, à une, une, une urgence euh, développée depuis mercredi. Je pense qu'on n'est pas en présence du même, du, du, du même diagnostic, et en particulier des mêmes causes. Alors, vous me posez surtout la question de savoir si, euh, dans ce risque-là, on, on, on envisage des opérations de refinancement euh, et si on envisage des, des décotes sur les collatéraux. Aujourd'hui, nous disposons euh, des lignes euh, de financement euh, tout à fait suffisantes et tout à fait euh, euh, nécessaires et généreuses euh, pour permettre aux banques de se, de se financer. Je l'ai dit en anglais tout à l'heure, on est en mesure de fournir d'autres outils si c'est nécessaire. Euh, on a dans le passé fait des LTRO euh, qui, euh, qui peuvent être réactivés éventuellement. On est aujourd'hui en régime de euh, décote sur collatéraux qui euh, subsiste et continue à se poursuivre jusqu'au mois de juin prochain. Il ne nous paraît pas utile pour l'instant, en tout cas, euh, d'envisager d'autres euh, programmes et de façonner d'autres outils que ceux qui sont actuellement disponibles et qui se nous paraissent suffisants. Merci. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Gunnar Beck for ID. Madame Lagarde, ich hörte Ihnen aufmerksam zu und Sie sagten, Sie hätten auch am letzten Donnerstag angesichts der anhaltend hohen Inflation weitere Zinserhöhungen angekündigt und dass Sie nur die Stabil Instabilitätsrisiken an den Finanzmärkten von dieser Ankündigung abhielten. Ist es richtig, daraus zu folgern, dass diese Instabilitätsrisiken also keineswegs trivial sind? Sonst hätten Sie ja Ihre Vorprognose für die nächsten Sitzungen nicht abgeändert. The financial tensions that we have observed for the last uh, 10 days or so are, are not trivial. Uh, and uh, whenever a financial actor of the size of the Silicon Valley Bank, for instance, which was the uh, 13th largest bank in the United States, or the second largest bank uh, in a country like Switzerland, um, have to go very rapidly into either resolution on the one hand or... Um, um, a, a, a takeover on the other hand, it is not without repercussions. But what we have indicated uh, in the press release that we issued last night is that we welcome the Swiss authorities and the Swiss decisions um, that was made in order to address the situation and uh, that it was necessary in order to restore financial stability. 
uh, in the same vein, the very rapid action that was taken by the, uh, the US authorities to uh, do what was necessary in order to prevent uh, any contagion was also uh, certainly appropriate from a financial stability point of view. But we have to be data dependent and we have to look at what the consequences will be, uh, what impact it will have on yields, what impact it will have on the financing of the economy and of certain sectors in particular. And once we see that, then it will help us determine uh, what monetary policy decision we make. So I'm not, you know, um, minimizing, but I'm also saying that we have a strong banking sector, uh, much stronger than it was during the last great financial crisis, which is uh, strongly capitalized, which has strong liquidity, and, uh, and which is certainly well supervised uh, and... Uh, you know, as opposed to other countries where all banks are subject to Basel III, not some banks, all banks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Denis Neshi for ECR. Grazie, Presidente Lagarde, per la sua presenza qui. Eh, grazie per le tante risposte che ha già dato. Eh, io ho sentito, ascoltato molto bene quello che lei ha detto e nel... Nel, ha ripetuto molte volte la, la, il tema centrale che è l'obiettivo della BCE nel medio e lungo termine è portare il tasso di inflazione al 2% che eh, con questa azione eh, ripetuta però di tassi di interesse che vengono eh, aumentati il contraccolpo nel brevissimo periodo soprattutto per famiglie e imprese e consumatori è pesantissimo io mi riferisco soprattutto al tema dei mutui famiglie e consumatori sono realmente in difficoltà nel rispettare le scadenze con gli istituti di credito e allo stesso tempo le imprese in questo scenario così complicato a livello economico difficilmente possono programmare delle azioni di sviluppo e quindi portare alla, a una crescita economica e se è giusto quello che lei ha detto che bisogna puntare sulla stabilità ma io penso che allo stesso tempo è doveroso puntare anche alla crescita quindi sono due, due eh, definizioni che devono andare necessariamente di, di pari passo allora io non le faccio una domanda il mio più un auspicio è che quella visto che lei ancora ha detto che non ha non sa se nel futuro ci saranno aumenti eh, di tassi il mio auspicio è quello di fermare possibilmente ammorbidire questa, eh, questa azione politica della BCE per portare a una, una boccata d'ossigeno a famiglie, imprese e consumatori grazie Mr. Um, Nechi, thank you for bringing that up. And uh, rest assured that this is not something that um, I forget when I go to bed every night. I know that some people are suffering more than others. And I know in particular that the most vulnerable, uh, whether they are employees, whether they are small business owners, uh, are taking a big hit as a result of inflation. I have family members who are in that situation, so I can see it very close to home, I can assure you. And, you know, if anything, it brings, it gives me more determination, more passion and more energy to reduce that inflation, to restore price stability, because we know that without price stability, we will not have growth. We will not have economic decisions that are uh, made for the future and, and to improve uh, the state of our economies. So. Price stability is a precondition for, uh, for growth, for employment, for investment decisions, for innovation. And our duty is to uh, bring that price stability and we will do it. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Anna Asimakopoulou uh, 